not supposed to be doing that either. I try and win him. Maybe it might be a little bit shorter some too. He said, no, we can't have that. <laughs> I did want to mention uh, that uh, the stand close called yesterday and they had made it to Charlotte, so we grateful that they that part of their trip has been safe at least, so uh, continue remembering them as they travel as well. We have been looking at David and God's statement in Acts 13th chapter, verses 22 in particular, where it mentions that God gave testimony to David that in that he said that I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That thus we have for us in our consideration this man after God's own heart. But what made David a man after God's own heart? And we have been looking at several different aspects because certainly David was a great individual within the Old Testament. He was one of the kings of Israel, if not one of the greatest, uh, or if not the greatest, one of the greatest. He was a great fighter, a warrior. He, many of the psalms that we have in the book of Psalms were written by him. He, through his uh, descendants, the Savior, came into this world. So why, though, would God call him a man after mine own heart? Uh, and there are, and we've been looking at different factors as to uh, that reason. But one of those reasons that we've been looking at is because that he had a respect for that which was holy. And we've looked at different aspects of this and making an application to us today in several different areas that he had respect for the word of God. And you can see that throughout his life, that he respected God's word and what it said, and so he tried to live it and without change and alteration any at all. Uh, he tried to do it only in all of that which God had set forth. Uh, in making the application, we have to respect the church uh, and keep a respect for the church and all of the aspects of the church. If we want to be that type of individual that God is going to say that we are after his own heart. Um, but we want to look at another aspect of that respect this morning, or a couple of areas. And that is we need to have a respect for those in seats of authority. In Second Peter, the second chapter, the entire chapter is dealing with individuals that have gone off into apostasy. They are wicked individuals. And as he's describing them in this second chapter, he comes, we come down to verse 10, and he says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Notice the emphasis that Peter is making upon these individuals who are wicked individuals. They are living contrary to God's word. But what are they doing? At least in this aspect, they have a lack of respect for those individuals who are in authority. They despise governments. They're self-willed. They're presumptuous. They will even speak evil of dignities. Jude will write much the same thing in Jude the 8th verse through the 10th verse. And again, Jude is dealing with these individuals who, because he says, verse 3, his need, he wanted to write of common salvation, but it was needful for him to deal with these subjects instead because there were some individuals who were, again, wicked, evil individuals. And so he comes down and describing these individuals, and he says that likewise, these also are also these filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, 
despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But that which are but what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Again, there is an emphasis on a respect for those in authority. Those who are, as putting it here, dominion, dignities. Uh, and here is an illustration that he uses for our consideration. Here is Michael the archangel, and the archangel in relationship with God. And here is Satan. And they are disputing, they are contending about the body of Moses. Now, what all that involves, I don't know. Uh, that's all that we're told about. I have my uh, guesses, and probably other people have their guesses, but we're not told about it. But we are told that they were content. There's a contention there about the body of Moses. But here is Michael, the archangel, when in that dispute would not even bring a railing accusation against Satan himself, the devil. Now he did say, "The Lord rebuke thee." But he himself would not bring a, a railing accusation against even Satan. There's respect that he had there for one who, yes, even evil, but yet in a place of authority. Let's make an application in a couple of areas, and that's what we want to deal with really this morning. And the first of those is government itself. That we need to have a respect for our government. In Romans 13th chapter, verses 1 through 7, Paul writes, But let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. <coughs> but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. <laughs> Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Notice these statements that Paul makes about government. And that's the higher powers that is being discussed here. Now first off, we are to be subject to the higher powers. We are to submit ourselves to them. And then he adds that there is no power but of God and the powers of the are ordained of God. So here is government. And he says that the government is of God, and they are ordained of God. But we know in our society today, and in the United States, that that's only the good presidents and the good governments in that right. Well, so it would seem. And if it's an evil government, as we would be an evil government, then that doesn't apply to them, does it? They're not put there by God. Just, uh, you know, the 
citizens kind of got crazy and uh, elected the wrong individual. Brethren, we need to be careful as to how we act toward our government. And we need to recognize that even those individuals in the government who are not what they should be and who might be evil are still in places of authority that we need and must respect. I think it's interesting. If you turn over to Romans 13th chapter here, how many of us know what is the verse and the sentence that comes right before this statement, let every be so uh, let every soul be subject to thy iron powers. How many of us know what he's talking about? Actually, go back a few verses. To chapter uh, 12. And start looking at about verse uh, 17. To recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto that. For, men, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if I envy hunger, feeding, if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject to higher power. He's talking about here is good and evil. And on this, the very next statement about not being overcome of evil, but overcoming evil with good, he talks about the government. I wonder if there's a reason there. You know, we look at our government today, and there have been individuals within our government who their lives are ungodly, they're contrary to everything that is good and wholesome, and yet we think because of that, many times we don't have to respect them. We make fun of them and say all of these things about them. How many of us, if we could transport ourselves back to the first century when this was written, how many of us think that the government that was under the, in control at that time, that they were good and honest and they were upright in all of their dealings with people and that they were morally good people now, if you believe that that's the case, uh, I've got some land to sell you. It's good prime land, too. They were evil, ungodly. You talk about a comparison with the worst individuals in our government today, and our people don't even hold a candle to some of the things that they would do. That's how evil they were. I mean, some of our evil individuals would make them look, or would, uh, they would make them look like angels. And they're not by any means, but uh, in a comparison with what they were back then. And, and here is Paul saying, you respect them. You be subject to them. Because there is no power but of God. And these ungodly, immoral, and maybe immoral really might not even be an accurate term. They might have been more amoral than immoral. And if you don't know the differences, um, immoral is just they're not moral. Amoral is without morals, totally. They didn't have any. No morals. 
that would be probably more accurate in relationship to those individuals. And he says, yeah, there is no power but of God in relationship to these individuals. We, several years ago, and I think a lot of this was brought on by uh, late night comedians, started ridiculing our government and those in government offices. And it has carried over into our society. And when someone comes along that we disagree with, then we don't think anything about saying and doing anything that uh, will oppose them. Whether it's true or not doesn't really make any difference. Brethren, we need to be careful how we deal with government and those in governmental offices. It's a serious thing because they are of God. Their authority comes from God. They are, there is no power but that is ordained of God. And when we resist them and we start speaking, uh, we start speaking evil of dignities, then we come under the condemnation of God. We need to be careful about these things. It is serious business. Now, he does set forth, yes, that here's the purpose of government. It is that they are to punish evil and they are to praise good. But what about a government that turns that around? They praise the evil and condemn the good. Guess what? Roman government did that. Look at what they did to Christians. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime. And see some of the atrocities that they did to those who were Christians. Why? Simply because they were Christian. They turned around what they should have been doing. But yet, Paul is still saying, you submit yourselves to me. Now, does that mean that we can't identify what they are? I think it's interesting. Jesus is told, Herod wants to see you. And he tells the individuals who come to tell him, go tell that thought. What was he doing? He was identifying the nature of Herod. There's nothing wrong with identifying the nature of that individual. I'm not talking about that. It's not speaking evil of that individual to identify what he's doing and what he is. When Felix uh, had, along with his wife, had, we were listening to Paul, Paul reasoned of righteousness. Why? Because Felix was not a righteous individual. He raised him righteousness, temperance, self-control. Felix showed, demonstrated within his life, no self-control and judgment to come. And it says that Felix trembled. It scared him to death because of what Paul had told him. Didn't get him to repent and do what's right. But he identified the evil that he was involved in. When John the Baptist is before Herod, he would tell Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It was sin, it was evil. He identified the sin that he was involved in, said it's not right. There's nothing wrong with us opposing those things that are wrong. We must do that, even with the government. But yet, we still do it in such a way that we show respect for the office that they hold. And then we submit to them. 
we do what they say. And when we fail to do that, what they say, hey, it's interesting. Paul, standing before a group, basically makes a statement, if I've done anything worthy of death, I'm willing to die. In other words, I'm going to take responsibility for that which I've done. If I've done that which is wrong, then yes, you should punish me. I deserve it. I will accept it. If I've done that which is wrong. Now, Paul had not done anything that was wrong or that was worthy of death. He knew that. But that was his attitude. You have that right because you're the government. And it's my responsibility and obligation to submit myself to you. Whether you're good or whether you're evil doesn't make any difference. It's my obligation to submit to the government. And they have the right, yes, of executing those individuals who are evildoers. That's the idea of there in verse 4, that he beareth not the sword in vain. The sword was an instrument of death. And so, what is it? We are to be subject to them. We are to do what they say. And that includes paying taxes to uh, Verse 6, for, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also. We don't cheat on our taxes. We don't have to pay more than what we owe by any means. We do have to pay what we owe. Peter would say much the same thing in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and verse 14. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or to governors, or to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. Well, the king... We don't have a king in our society, but it would be likened to our federal government. Governors would be likened to maybe our state governments, our city, local governments. Them that are sent by him for the punishment, that would be like police officers. We, those in authority, those governmental officers, they are to be obeyed. We are to submit to them. And then, of course, when they try to make a law, forbid us doing something that God says to do, God says this, they say don't do it, then, of course, it's our obligation. I must obey God rather than men. That's the fifth chapter. But otherwise, my obligation as a Christian submit to but also to show them the proper respect that their office holds. But also, not only in relationship to government, but the elders within the local congregation. Earlier in, this, uh, in these lessons, we dealt with the organization of the church and how that God is the head of the church, or Christ is the head of the church. And within the local congregation, there are elders who oversee, that, over, that rule over the local congregation. But we are to likewise submit to those elders. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13, We beseech you, brethren, know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love, for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Here is those who labor among us, the elders of the congregation. They are over you in the Lord. They admonish you. That's their obligation. That's their work. We are to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Because of the work that they are doing, we are to hold them up in esteem. We're not to denigrate the elders of the local congregation. When congregations work in that way, then be at peace among yourselves. I think it's interesting that the peace comes as a result of the proper relationship of the elders and members. 
And when the elders are doing their work and the members are responding in the way in which they're supposed to to the elders, the result within the local congregation is going to be peace. The problem comes along, though, when the elders may be doing their job and members don't like it. And then there's no peace. Why? Because they don't respect the elders as they're supposed to respect. The Hebrews writer, Hebrews 13, verse 7, says to remember them that have a rule over you. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. <coughs> who have spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. He goes on in verse 17 and tells us to obey them that have a rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. They rule over us. Now, does that mean that they can come along and make rules that God doesn't make? Well, certainly not. Christ is the head of the church, not the elders. But within the local congregation, they're going to be make the ones making decisions in relationship to the local congregation and carrying out that which God has commanded and authorized. And in those areas, it becomes my obligation and your obligation to submit to them, to obey them in those matters. Now, Paul, you told your turn your hearing aids off on this. I'm going to use myself as an illustration. What if uh, Paul and Fred got together and they came to me and said, Michael, I think that uh, we think that uh, we need to get someone else to be the preacher of this congregation. <laughs> he said he's going to turn them up now. Eh? I may disagree with that assessment that they've made. They say, we think it would be better for this congregation. I may disagree. I may not like it. What's my obligation? My obligation is to obey them. My obligation would be to hold up their hands. They have that right. They are the ones who are overseeing this congregation. They're the ones who are responsible for the souls of this congregation. I may disagree, I may express my disagreement to I probably would. And they would expect that. But it's still their decision to make. And it's still my obligation to obey. Whether I like it or whether I don't, I still have to obey them because they have the rule over me. They're watching for the souls of this congregation. But if I should start running over here to the Brother Pierce and Brother Fuck, you know what those old dirty dog elders did? You know, they're not really. And when I start griping and complaining and I start denigrating the elders, I sin. All of a sudden, fire. <laughs> and rightfully so. No, what my responsibility would be to hold up their hands. If they have that right, if they're watching for our souls, they believe in their wisdom that this is best, and they need to be supported in it. In everything, in every way that is right. Rather far too many times. What we see within congregations is an eldership makes a decision. And members don't like it. And so they go start talking to one another. Those elders don't know what they're doing. They didn't think about this. They should have thought about it. They and we start griping and complaining, and brother, it's sin. Go back to that which is stated in 1 Thessalonians 5. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace. When we 
you start going back and forth and griping and complaining behind the backs of the elders, then it's not going to be conducive to peace. That's when the disharmony, when the, we're going to be destroyed one of another. But when I support them, they have this right. Yeah, I might disagree with it. But they're the ones who are in overseas. They're the ones who, through their wisdom, are trying to do what is best. They're the ones who have responsibility for your soul. They have a responsibility of getting you to heaven, making sure that you're fed properly God's work. I'm going to support them in everything that's right and honorable. And there's going to be peace and brethren. Far too many times that doesn't happen. We need to learn respect. Respect begins, no doubt, in the home. A respect for parents. Parents acting in such a way that their children can respect them. <clears throat> then a respect for our school. Because it goes, it transforms from the home to the school system and those who are teachers within the school. And it will go from that to, yes, the elders of local congregation. And it will, yes, include respect for God. When we fail in any of those aspects to have the proper respect that God expects us to have and that God wants us to have, then what's going to take place eventually is we lose respect for God. Again, go back to what God says in relationship to governmental authority. There is no power but of God. If that's the case, that the powers that be are ordained of God, if I don't respect them, then how can I respect God? If I can't learn to submit to them, then how can I learn to submit to God? To respect and obedience and submission is a general thing that we either learn or we fail to learn. And we better learn to respect God, Christ, the church, the elders, the government, the school, the parents, all of those who sit in places of authority. Because if we fail, then we're going to fail in relationship to God. If you've not been obedient to God and His will, submitted yourself to Him, humble obedience, and that's what it's going to take in order to go to heaven. That's what it's going to take in order to become a Christian. Submitting yourself to God, recognizing His authority over you, and recognizing what He has to say in relationship to becoming a Christian. That through your faith, you repent of your sins, you make a confession of Jesus Christ as God's Son. And then you're baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Submitting yourself to His will to become a Christian. But then as a Christian, you continue to submit to His will as to how we are to live. That we are to live godly. We are to live above reproach in this world. That people, when they see us, will see the epitome of morality and of goodness and of righteousness. That they will see Christ living in us. That's not the type of life that we live as a child of God. We need to come back into Him and repent of your sins. Make things right with God. For the salvation of your soul. So you have that joyous return when Christ comes again. A return to God and have an eternity with Him in heaven. You need to come. We pray with you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song.